Uh, it's just one, one, uh, one amendment here. Uh, the IoT OT is for a longer talk. Since I'm doing a half hour talk, I'm just going to focus on the OT. I hope that's okay. If you want to talk more about IoT scanning, you can find me uh, afterwards in the hallway. So yeah, like you mentioned, um, my name is Huxley Barbie. That is not a handle. That is my real name. I'm the only Huxley Barbie you're ever going to meet. Uh, somebody did ask me earlier today if that was my handle. But uh, you know, uh, these are two organizations that I'm associated with. But more importantly for this talk, I have spent many years as a security consultant with customers that have OT environments. So we're talking about higher ed, transportation, uh, manufacturing. So we're talking about robotic arms, uh, devices that you would see on, in rail and transport stations, uh, research devices, and so on and so forth. And what I hope for you by the end of this talk is to know more about OT than you had uh, did previously, give you a few pointers on how to do your own security research in OT, understand the challenges that come with building out an asset in inventory for your OT environment, and then finally give you a few ideas on t how to overcome those challenges. Does anybody know what percentage of chips are manufactured for IT devices? Take a guess. Any number, any number will work. So yeah, IT devices. 40%, okay. 90% of chips are developed for embedded devices. Only 10% are for IT devices. This, this, this statistic boggles the mind because what it really means is that the attack surface that's available to the adversary on the, on the IoT and OT side is much, much, much larger. Even though most of us focus a lot of our time on the left-hand side over here. Many of these uh, are IoT devices. Right? We like to joke about how like, oh, lava lamps and, and coffee cups are on the, on the internet now, right? Uh, but they're also rudimentary devices like home automation, uh, printers, IP cameras, and so on and so forth. But even more important are these OT devices, operational technology devices that CISA considers to be part of critical infrastructure and key resources. We're talking about robotic arms, uh, valves, uh, things that work our dams, things that work our water treatment plants, and so on and so forth. I also include in here a healthcare device. Oftentimes, this is called IOMT, Internet of Medical Things. Uh, but because it is considered critical infrastructure and key resource, I bucket it under OT instead. Uh, one other thing to note in this talk is I am using OT and ICS, industrial control systems, interchangeably in this particular talk, just, just for this, uh, the, talk, the purpose of this talk. All right, so even though these OT environments are very important to our lives, all of our lives, they are shockingly unprotected. But when I say OT, exactly what, I, what do I mean? Because if you're like me, you grew up in an IT world, right? In your dorm, you probably set up a laptop or a desktop or a tower, and you were playing around with, you know, playing around uh, with, with, uh, with what you had. Most of us don't get a chance to have an OT device, a PLC, in our dorm. So it's a little bit foreign to many of us. So let's dig a little bit deeper into OT so we can improve our understanding. All right, first, one humongous disclaimer. This is one example, and out in the world, you're going to see other examples that diverge quite a bit from this, right? Because on the IT side, we got a PC or you got a Mac, right? And you can use those devices for a variety of purposes. Financial modeling, doing homework, streaming videos, playing games, and so on and so forth. On the OT side, devices are generally built for one single purpose. And so for that reason, there's way, way, way more variety. So just keep in mind, this is one example. Out in the, out in the field, you're going to see something that, that diverges from this quite a bit. So what we have here is a water treatment tank. There is dirty water that comes up from the left pipe, and then the cleaned up, cleaned up water goes down the right pipe. And what we have here are these two sensors. Okay, And so what happens is when the water level is lower than the lower sensor, the, water, the dirty water gets pumped in. Right? This valve opens up. This pump pumps in the water. And when the water reaches higher than the higher sensor, uh, that closes up. It stops pumping, and then after an hour of treatment, this valve then opens up, and then it drains out. The pump and the valves are known as actuators. And again, 
out in the field, things might look different because in some cases, actuators and sensors are integrated, right? Lots of variety out there. The thing that controls this entire operation is known as a PLC, right? It's the brains of the operation. Frequently, this is the thing that has an IP address. Um, and again, out in the world, if you are at a utility plant, electrical plant, the PLC might be called an IED instead, intelligent electrical device. This over here is an HMI, and this is an interface that a technician uses to control the behavior of the PLC, or through the PLC. Think thermostat in your house, not a full computer, a lockdown interface that's used by a technician. If you do want to rewrite how the PLC behaves, then you do have, what you have is an engineer's workstation. This actually is an IT device. And typically, this is going to be some old version of, version of Windows, such as Windows XP. I've heard from someone, not, uh, not myself, but I heard from someone that I actually found an engineer's workstation that was running Windows 3.1. I also heard uh, this other great story. So there's this VP uh, at some like $6 billion company. And he knew how important those engineering workstations would be to his operations. He found somebody with uh, a Windows XP laptop he paid the guy like with a six pack of beer. And ever since he got it, he's left that XP laptop in the desk, in, in the drawer in his desk, and he's kept it there for years. Just in case the OT environments that he manages, you know, ever loses that, that, that particular laptop, which I thought this guy was great because he's basically funding the implementation of his disaster recovery through, through beer, which, you know, I don't, I don't ever get to do that. Okay, so. Um, all right, this is what is known as a distributed control system, okay? Uh, sorry, this is one OT system, and at a site, you might find multiple of, the, of these that are all coordinate, coordinating each, with each other in what is known as a DCS, a distributed control system. But in some cases, these OT systems are gonna be spread over a large geographic area, organized into what is known as a SCADA, supervisory uh, and um, supervisory control and data access. And in those cases, you're also going to find an RTU, which relays from the PLC back to some sort of uh, control center, mission control type of place. So this is a quick tour of what an OT system looks like, what an OT environment looks like. Just keep in mind, out in the field, um, might look a little, bit, a little bit different. So next, next, let's take a look at how securing OT environments is gonna be different than securing IT environments. So in IT, we care about restricting access to data, moving data, making sure that it's encrypted while it's, it's moving, and so on and so forth. With OT, you care about moving stuff, widgets, gears, and, and things like this. How many people here have a phone that's older than five years old? Okay, very few, very few. You know, our IT devices, laptops, phones, they are, are manufactured with planned obsolescence. On the OT side, you're looking at devices that have been in commission, operating for 20, 30 years. I even heard from one particular uh, organization where they had a time horizon of 50 years, meaning many of these devices are, have been operating or will continue to operate, and they're older than many of us in, in this room. Uh, if, if, uh, if you've been around for a little while, you've heard of the CIA triad or AIC triad, which, whatever you call it, right? Uh, on the IT side, we, we care about all those things. But on the OT side, there's, it, there isn't really a triad. It's all about availability. These organizations will do everything possible to avoid an outage. And I want to dig into this a little bit deeper because this, this is going to be important later. So imagine if this is a commercial organization right, let's say it's uh, oil and gas. Every second that they're not moving oil and gas is a uh, financial loss, but it goes beyond that. Because many of these OT environments are part of critical infrastructure and key resources, they are also highly regulated. So Colonial Pipeline once had an outage and then FISMA came in and then fined them uh, for a uh, million dollars on top of their financial loss, right? So there's that component of, of it going on. If this is not a commercial organization, but a governmental or quasi-governmental organization, you could imagine that perhaps there is some politician out there that wants to avoid the bad press of you know, the municipal 
water treatment plant going down or something like that. Uh, so for these reasons, it's plain that availability is paramount. This is absolutely the most important thing in any OT environment. On the IT side, we have these time-sharing operating systems that we all know. On the OT side, you have real-time operating systems, and there are far, far more of them. Now, of course, this has ramifications for security, right? So if I were an EDR vendor, and what would I do? Well, I write one version of my EDR for Linux, another version for Mac, another version for Windows, forget BSD. Um, but I can't really do that on, on the OT side. Which of these 65 operating systems am I, am I going to write my EDR for? What is my financial model to get a return on investment? Do I, do I take the effort to do like the top 10, the top 20, top 30? It's a very different, uh, it's a very different story in, in terms of securing OT because of the variety of operating systems. On the IT side, I'm sure you've heard of all these programming languages. On the OT side, they have completely different programming languages, which uh, and this is a, sort of like an IDE uh, for OT programming. Uh, the ramification here is many of the innovations on the IT side in terms of secure development lifecycle, you know, how we release, how we engineer code, how we QA code, doesn't really translate to the OT side. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit. On the IT side, we're all familiar with uh, Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. On the OT side, it's like patch September, or like patch never. Why? Because these organizations want to avoid an outage. They do not want to take any sort of outage for any sort of updates or security patches, and they absolutely want to avoid any sort of extended outage that might come from a, a bad update. All right, insecure by design. To this day, you still find a lot of OT devices that do not require authentication, that do not encrypt their traffic. All right, security controls and governance. There are a lot of security controls that are available on the IT side, right? Unlike 20 or 30 years ago where, you know, most devices didn't even have like antivirus on them. Uh, that's still the case. It's almost as if on the OT side, you get taken back in time, like back to the future, like 30 years. There are no security controls in many cases. And there's also no security governance. You will find very often a lot of these devices have default usernames, default passwords, default ports that they listen on, default configurations. All right, and this one, this one's gonna be key. Right? IT devices are connected to networks these days, wireless, wired, or what have you, indirectly connected to the internet somehow, or directly. In the past, OT environments were always air-gapped. If you want to compromise the device, you have to walk up to it and do something to it. Not foolproof, of course, of course right? Stuxnet was, was, uh, was done through a USB, uh, USB drive, right? But for the most part, people thought, you know, we're safe. All these other things up here that make this environment insecure, it's fine because you had to walk up to it. But here's the thing. Around 2005 or so, things changed. These environments started getting connected to networks. Why would they do that? Well, again, the business wins. There are operational efficiencies that come from connecting OT environments to, to the rest of the network. So imagine if I have a valve that's out in the middle of nowhere. Do I want to fly somebody out there, out into the middle of nowhere, just to turn a valve? Or would it be better for me if I could just, back in you know, headquarters, push a button to operate that valve? Right, clearly, there are operational efficiencies for connecting OT environments into the network. You save money, you save time, you save you know, people flying around, and so on and so forth. But the thing is, this whole security through isolation came down. That curtain of air gapness came down as, as one of the ramifications for this operational efficiency. So starting around 2005 or so, and it's been a continuing trend, you now have the situation 
where all of these other things that made these OT environments insecure have been laid bare to the adversary over the internet. Is anybody scared yet? No? Okay. All right. So those of you who are a little bit familiar, familiar with uh, OT might say, but Huxley, there's this Purdue model. Let's like, we do the Purdue model and everything's fine. So this is, this is the Purdue model, okay? So the idea here is you stratify your risk by uh, divvying up your various devices into these layers. Um, so you can see here layer zero, those are those, uh, those sensors and actuators. Uh, layer one, this is, this is uh, uh, these are your PLCs. Over here, this is where like IPs start showing up. Uh, two and three, you got your HMIs, and then all the way at the top, you have some other stuff up there, right? Um, so two, uh, oh, one other thing. Uh, with, with Purdue, the idea here is each layer can only communicate with an adjacent layer. So if you're in layer one, you can only communicate with two or zero. You should not be able to jump, right? And the other part of it is between layers, you should have some sort of control that adjudicates communication across, the board, across that boundary. So this could be a physical control, like being air-gapped, uh, or some sort of network control, IPS, firewall, and so on and so forth. All right, so, so two things here. Yes, there's stratification of risk here, but here's the thing, right? On the IT side, you'll notice on layer five there, it looks very IT-ish. We start seeing a lot of IT devices, whereas down at the bottom, we see more OT devices, right? And as we talked about, OT devices are far less secure than IT devices. So what this means is, if you're able to infiltrate the top, it's a foregone conclusion that you're gonna make it down. Because each layer you come down, it just gets easier and easier and easier. All right? The other thing here is that this is oftentimes a myth. Very, very, very few organizations actually fully express Purdue in the way it's supposed to. In fact, here's an example. Remember, PLCs are supposed to be in layer one. Supposedly, you have to go from five, four, three, two, one to get to a PLC. But guess what? Through Shodan or Google, you can easily find PLCs that are directly connected to the internet. And remember what I said about security governance or lack thereof a default username or password will probably get you in there. Default usernames and passwords that you can find on GitHub. Oh, and if they, for some reason, decided to change the username and password, remember I said, these devices are often never patched. So you can go to CISA's website, you know, look up the KEV for that device, and you probably can use it to exploit that device. And you don't have to do anything hard or different because there are Metasploit modules <laughs> to do that. All right, so um, some of you might, might, might have like a, an unfinished bunker that you're building in your house. Yes, you should actually go, absolutely go uh, take a look at that. Or you know, if you have a plan for going off the grid, I wouldn't blame you. Um, and I was being a little facetious earlier by saying, oh, you know, uh, there, there are you know, financial reasons why all these organizations care about uh, avoiding outages. But that in no way discounts the importance of availability of these environments, right? These are the environments that, that manufacture our, our pharmaceuticals, make sure that we have electricity in our house, clean water that we can drink, and so on and so forth. So for those of us who are engaged in the defense of OT environments, what do we do? Well, one of the first things you want to do, of course, CIS control number one, is to figure out what you have, figure out what it is that you need to go defend and protect. And historically, um, in the past, when organizations have attempted to do active scanning of OT environments, things have gone bad, right? Uh, outages, financial loss, and so on and so forth. Many of them uh, bordering on catastrophic, but we don't hear about it because typically the organization will say, oh, it was a mechanical failure or something like that. I heard from somebody that the 2003 outage on the eastern seaboard was because of an active scan, but of course it's never been confirmed. So don't quote me on that. Um, so for that reason, many organizations re rely on passive, uh, passive discovery to inventory their OT environments. 
So let's take a look at that. What does that mean? How does that work? Well, if you want to set up a spam port from a single switch out to this collector of that network traffic for passive discovery, that's very easy, right? Three lines of iOS, and you're good to go. And typically, when you do a POC, you know, this, this, is, this is what you do. But how many of you work at a place that has a single switch? Anybody? Just one switch? No? Okay. Yeah, typically what's going to happen is you're going to have multiple interconnected switches. And, well, then what do you do? Well, you could have all these switches go directly to the collector. That's, that's problematic. Typically what you're going to end up doing is using one of these protocols. Of course, you're going to hope and pray that all these switches support that protocol and that version of that protocol, and they're all the same, right? Uh, another, another option is to deploy more, more collectors. You could do that too, but that's sort of trading one problem for another problem. And what if, what if you're actually working with a SCADA system? Now you have many, many interconnected switches that are geographically geographically dispersed. I submit to you that it is damn near impossible to get a full asset inventory using this model because you can't get to enough choke points on the network to make sure that you're getting everything. And many, many organizations with all the best of intentions after spending months and even years still do not have a comprehensive or accurate asset inventory. The deployment is very complex, as I just illustrated. The performance is poor unless you have invested in these really beefy hardware appliances uh, to collect all the traffic. And for all that cost and all that effort, what do you get? You get an inventory that's missing devices, and because you're limited to the network traffic that's going across the wire, you don't actually interrogate those devices, your fingerprinting is also going to be inaccurate, or at least vague. But Organizations are willing to put up with all of these things just to avoid outages. So here's the novel part of this talk. Why don't we take a look at active scanning again and understand why it has failed in the past? And that actually becomes the five principles of active scanning in OT. So first principle. First principle is to always send standard packets and expected payloads. Take a look at uh, packet 2053 here. Notice how the fin bit, the push bit, and the urgent bit are on. This is not something that um, any application would send as a normal course of network communication. This is the type of packet that you would get from a legacy scanner, uh, something that uses SYNFP for fingerprinting uh, or, or even MMAP. They purposely send this type of traffic to see what kind of response comes back from that device and based on the response, fingerprint that device. And this works really, really good for IT devices uh, or any device that might have been you know, built in the last five years. With OT devices, on the, on the other hand, they will crash or they will reboot or they will freeze up. Why is this? Well, remember what I said earlier. All this innovation in software engineering, release engineering, quality assurance that has happened on the IT side in the last 30 years has not translated over. The network stack on these devices are not very popular because there's so many different types of them. They're archaic, they're not popular, so they're not well tested. And also, testing of an OT device is more like, if I push this button, does it do that? It does? Okay, then we're done. Nobody's out there doing QA on these devices to make sure that they can handle arbitrary traffic. That's true of the network stack on these devices, but also the applications themselves as well. They're not tested for robustness, and so therefore, they are prone to disruption when they see something like this. Number two, security probes. Security probes, very much like on the, uh, on the, on the last principle, uh, is, is in and of itself uh, unexpected traffic. These devices are not built to handle a vuln check, and so, when it sees it or when it happens, they will, they, will, they will be disrupted, they will freeze, they will crash, they will reboot. Otherwise behaving erratically. All right, the third one here, got to give you a little bit of background. So we have this uh, mission control back over here. And out in the middle of nowhere is this pipe, right? 
this out in the middle of nowhere is so far out that you're not going to get Fios, you're not going to get DSL, but instead, you know, they have a phone line. So they actually set up an old school modem, I don't know, 56K or, or whatever, right? So very slow link. And there are some cases for some of these organizations where they have a particular site that's even further out where you can't even get a phone line. So they use other means to then get to the closest site and then relay off of the other really slow link. Generally speaking, some of these OT devices are very low powered, so they can't handle a massive amount of traffic all at once, right? They'll just crash, right? Remember, it's, an, it's a real-time operating system, not a time-sharing operating system. So too much of it, bad things can happen. But what we have is this, is here is a situation where it's not just the device itself, not just the endpoint that can't handle a lot of traffic. The network itself can't handle a lot of traffic. And this is very common with OT environments. So what you need to do is to, to have the ability to uh, do two things. One is you need to be able to tune the number of packets uh, per second you're going to send. But number two, you want to be able to distribute that scan traffic across all the endpoints you're trying to, uh, trying to inventory. And so the idea here is rather than sending all this traffic to him all at once, I'm going to send you one packet, send you one packet, send you one packet, and then I'll come back to it. In so doing, you're getting maximum coverage without overwhelming any sort of single endpoint, but at the same time, you're keeping your, your overall scan times uh, to a minimum. So that's number three. Number four, and this is extremely important. With OT devices, many times you will find some that even when you send standards compliant traffic, right, going back to principle number one, even when you send standards compliant traffic, the damn thing still crashes, right? It's, it's, just, it's just poorly written. Like the software on there is just, is just not good, it's not robust. It really is meant to like respond to somebody flipping a switch or, or pushing a button. So in this case, the strategy is to say, okay, we're not gonna do the SYNFP thing, which is to send all these different queries to that one device in order to get an understanding of what, in order to fingerprint it all at once. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna send that device one packet, a very super benign query. Just to say, you know, metaphorically, like, get the shape of that device. And then when you get that response, say, okay, I know this is this, and so therefore I, I can use this code path of queries. I'm gonna avoid this code path of queries. And iteratively sending successive queries to that particular device in order to fill in the, the shape that you fingerprinted earlier, right? Not 100% foolproof, right? But uh, it's worked out very well in the past. So sending iterative queries to a device in order to fill in the fingerprint uh, over, uh, over the scan, scan period. And the last principle here, the last principle here is probably the most important, probably, but probably the, like, the least well implemented because it's got nothing to do with code. It's, it's all about people, right? Um, test and scan over time, also known as don't be stupid, right? So you, you want to identify the sites, your OT sites. You want to identify to see if there's commonality or see if like just visually you can find any sort of um, overall categorization of those devices and then to attack them, uh, build that inventory slowly and small and then build it out over time. So those are the five principles of, of active scanning in OT, which, um, you know, as I mentioned before, is a, is a minority opinion here. Um, it's not something that people do very often, but, but it can work and it has worked. And I'll leave you with this parting thought. So there was a time where you followed all of these rules. But these days, you, you get in an Uber. Uh, those of you with Teslas might have tried the, the self-driving. I think most of you have probably bought Bitcoin or Ethereum at some point. And you've all worked from home at this point. And so I challenge you, maybe it's time to start thinking about active scanning for your OT environments as well. All right, folks, that's it for me. Connect with me in all these ways if you like. And I will be out in the hall over there if anybody has any questions.